For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I was saved at the age of 17, and I can still remember reading those words and thought how strange those words seemed. Why in the world would you be ashamed of the gospel? And yet, as I've gotten older in Christ and attended many different churches in many different, in at least three different states, I've come to realize that the gospel sometimes is something people are ashamed of. At least they don't seem to be too excited about sharing. But in my observation of the world, the observation of the city I'm in, the, the world events around me, I have to observe that the gospel is getting less reception, getting shared less in this world than ever before. In fact, I'm concerned that there may be a day in which no one will be able to share the gospel lest they be arrested or imprisoned. There are, there are countries today in which that's true. That if you share the gospel openly, you would be arrested, jailed, or beaten. Absolutely. And even there, there was an opening of the window for a while in Central Asia when the Soviet Union collapsed. And now, one by one, they're shutting down. That, they're that's right. The that's down. right. So, I feel the time is now to be ready to share the gospel. Things change. I think it would be surprising to most of you to realize that there's more Christians in China than there are in America mm. right mm. now. There are more Christians in Africa than there are in Europe. If you think through that, once these places we would call sending nations, nations that have, quote, been reached for Christ. But now if you look at Europe, for example, or even Britain, which at one time was where many missionaries were sent forth from in Scotland, these countries have very few believers, very few people attending church each week, very few who would claim to be born again. So we have an obligation in the communities that we're in, and especially in the city of Los Angeles, to share the gospel. Los Angeles is kind of a unique place in that if you look back in the history of Christianity and the impact Christianity has had on the world, Los Angeles has been one of the places where something has happened. I've mentioned that uh, before, so this may be stated before, but Billy Graham became a significant person in his revivals here in Los Angeles. 1948. 1948. Uh, if you look back uh, to, for example, um, uh, J. Vernon McGee, who created a, a radio program that went across the world, pastored a church in Los Angeles. His program is still on, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. All I'm saying is, is that we have had an influence that we don't seem to realize over not just our area, but over the entire planet that we may not understand. But at the same time, I see our witness in Los Angeles dwindling. So many conservative good churches are falling on hard times and closing their doors. The, the actual, I remember, and this goes back a long time, I, I, was not a, I did not grow up in a Christian family, okay? But I remember at Easter, they broadcast on television the, the service from the Hollywood Bowl, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the Easter service. That would be inconceivable today. That, would, that is just something that would be so far out, so inappropriate, that they would issue a hate, hate crime warnings for this right. station that would dare mention that. So we have a, a closing door. And I feel, and we've talked about this before, that if you look across the world, we see signs we're entering into the end times. The, the, the Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. And we're seeing an increasing number of, uh, uh, increase in lawlessness in our society, in, our, in everything that's going on. This is a sign of the end times. 
not to mention a rise in witchcraft and Satanism, which we also are seeing. <clears throat> the uh, part of the Catholic Church that does exorcisms are reporting an exponential, exponential increase in the number of exorcism requests that they're getting. Something is happening, people. I am saying something is going on. Now, given our just being aware of what's going on, I think that we have a, an, an urgency to share the gospel. And so I am starting a five-week series talking about the gospel. And its goal is to be not so much theoretical, but practical in terms of explaining how to share the gospel. It's not meant to create guilt. One of the things that, unfortunately, when you preach on this, everybody feels guilty. I don't want you to feel guilty. I want you to be, feel equipped and better able at the end of it to be actually sharing the gospel with someone. This is not designed to just ha be fruitless, but to produce fruit. Now today I'm starting out the series, I'm starting with the topic of the importance of the gospel. And I'm going to be sharing five reasons why the gospel is really important. And then building on this foundation that I'm sharing today, we'll go into what is the gospel and how to share it, and then how to share it to specific groups like millennials or Muslims or Mormons, <laughs> my M, M group. Uh, <laughs> but th these groups need to be reached, and there is things we need to know about sharing the gospel that are important. All right. The gospel is important. Five reasons. The reason, the reason number one we should share the gospel is Jesus is the only way to God. In Acts 4.12 it says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now this is a verse that probably many of you have heard before, but there's a lot in it in terms of what it's saying here. There's no other name. Now that name is Jesus. And it's talking about people who were sharing Jesus. And this name, it says, has been given among men. The, the word given there is a special tense in Greek. It's called the perfect tense. And I've talked about this tense before. But it's the idea that something happened in the past and it continues the results of that occurrence continues into the present with the expectation that there's, it's going to continue in, in the future. So the idea is, is that this name has been given. It is, it is permanent. It is, it is something that is still affecting us today. You know, Jesus is one of those words that... that <laughs> evokes so much emotion apart, upon people. Um, people were... People ar arrested somebody for showing a picture of Jesus to Mormons, uh, to Muslims, because they considered it a hate crime. Well, that shows a tremendous ignorance in Muslims, because Muslims actually revere Jesus as a prophet. And so it's not a hate, and not the, the Muslims, we don't see that as a, as a hate crime, but it's interesting how, how people want to, to keep the word Jesus out of our discussion, out of our society, out of our schools. It is, it is as something we would refer to a dirty word in our culture today. But this name of Jesus changes everything. It is the only name by which people can be saved. And it's interesting, not that they can be saved, it says, it, it, in my translation, by which we must be saved. And the word must there in the Greek is a, a little word that means of necessity. It is of a necessity that we must be saved by him. So it is a powerful testimony. But even in the first century, Jesus' name 
created opposition. People didn't want people to share it. And the authorities did so in telling Peter and, his, and, and the disciples that they should not be sharing it. In Acts, uh, I just quoted Acts 12. Later on, Acts 16 to 20, the authorities were discussing what we're going to do. And they said, what are we going to do with these men? The fact that a notable miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that they not spread, so that this will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And they summoned them, and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. The, the word we cannot stop speaking it says that it is literally the, the word power. We don't have the power to stop speaking about Jesus. That is how important the gospel is. You have been given something that you need to pass on. And we don't have the power to stop doing that. And that leads to point two. God has decided that you and I are the means to communicate the gospel. For whatever reason, God has decided to put his treasure in earthen vessels. Sometimes he's decided to put his treasure in cracked pots. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it, it, it is just simply, we are the container, the vessel. We're the envelope to the message. And we are the only means to get it to the people who need it. In Romans 10, 14, Paul says, how will they hear without a preacher? The gospel goes out and spread from faith to faith. And so the only way that the gospel is going to be spread is through our lips. And that's why in Mark 16, 15, it says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We are under a command to speak. But unfortunately, I see so much of a hesitance out there of sharing the gospel. And many different complaints of uh, reasons why they don't. And I want to kind of deal with individually these reasons why people don't share the gospel. One that I've heard is, well, God's elected whom he's going to bring. Nothing can thwart God's plan. All the elect will come to him, no matter what. I cannot change that. The elect, nothing can stop them from getting saved, and nothing can cause a non-elect person from getting saved. So, basically, what will be, will be. Those who God has chosen will, in no case, be hindered from being saved. And those who aren't saved will never be able to be saved because they're not chosen. What will be, will be. Now, this philosophy is called fatalism. It's the idea is that we cannot affect change in our lives or in our society. We are hopelessly bound by God's sovereignty, and thus we then don't share. Or at least there's no urgency to share. If I have time, I'll share, but I won't. I see this as an excuse rather than a valid point. Because I see so much saying, well, we preach because we know there's somebody who's going to hear. And that's why we preach. But again, it goes back to the point, well, but I'm not going to be able to change God's sovereign plan 
So whoever is going to be saved is going to be saved, and whoever is not saved is not. So I want to address this. And I want to say very clearly that the Bible does teach that we are all elect from the foundation of the world. And this election is made not on the basis of our worthiness, our goodness, but it is based on God's sovereign purpose. 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul writes, Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ have been chosen by God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we have always, but we always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of God, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Just to add to this, Peter says the same thing, 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. So I want to affirm very clearly that the Bible teaches that from all eternity, we have been chosen by God to be born again. That is, by his mercy, it is not according to our works, and that we have been chosen. However, that does not mean that everyone can't get saved. You see, the same writer who wrote this also knew that there was something else going on. For example, in Romans 9, you see very clearly Paul writes that by God's sovereign plan, he has chosen us by his mercy, and he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but God who has mercy. Romans 9. But there's Romans 10. Somehow people never get reading to Romans 10. In Romans 10, the same writer in the same book says, all can be saved. That's right. All can be saved. Where does he say that? Verses 8 through 13. Let me read them for, to you. What does it say? The word is near you in my mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the, Spirit, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for there is the same Lord uh, and, and Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now this is a very famous and well-quoted passage. And it goes back to the, the King James Version, which is very, very important. But for, for somebody like myself who can read the original Greek, I'm somewhat disappointed in how they translated this verse. Because we lose something in this. In Greek, there's a little word for all. Pas. It also can be, if it's neuter, it's pan. That's where we get pan-American. It means all-American. Uh, pas is a little word that's congregated masculine, feminine, neuter, that uh, is most times talked about as being all. In the 
in my trans in the in the Greek New Testament, or excuse me, in the New Testament, it's translated all 731 times in the New Testament. And it's, cre it's translated every in 128 times. And in the New Testament, seven times it's translated whoever. I'm kind of disappointed that it was translated whoever in uh, verse uh, 13 and, and then verse 11. Because you kind of lose the emphasis that Paul is trying to make in this. So I want to translate it the way I think would be clearer in verses 11 through 13. For the scripture says, all who believe in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jews, Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call upon him, for all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Four times in three verses, Paul uses the word all. And this repetition is meant to be noticed. It's meant for us to understand that all who believe in him will not be disappointed. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's emphasizing allness. <laughs> here. He's emphasizing that everyone who believes will be saved. Now, isn't this somewhat of a contradiction? I mean, it just seems like how do we fit this together? How do we fit together the fact that God is sovereign and before the foundation of the world chose us to be in him and the Bible teaches all could be saved. How can we affect God's will? How can this be possible? Well, I want you to know, first, the Bible teaches both these things. And I believe that we can affect God's will. How do I know? Prayer. Prayer is something that we need to remember can affect God's will. In James 4.2, it says, You do not have because you do not ask. Think about that. You do not have because you do not ask. It's kind of an implication that in the asking, your situation changes. God responds to what? you do in relationship to him. There's numerous examples of this in the Old Testament. For example, in the situation when Sodom was going to be destroyed, Abraham had a conversation with God. And he says, would you destroy the city if there were 50 righteous people? Far be it from you to do that. And God said, oh, I won't destroy the city if there are 50. Right? Oh, what, what if there are 40? <laughs> what if there are 30? What if there And he finally got, got down to 10, and he kind of left it there. Do I believe that Abraham's prayer changed the situation in, in Sodom? I would say yes. There's another illustration. This happens in the book of Isaiah. There's a story that Isaiah went to Hezekiah, who was the king of Israel, and told him, this is uh, Isaiah 38.1, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you how I have walked with you in truth and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah and said, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, you, I have seen your tears, behold, I will add 15 years of your life. Hezekiah's prayer 
changed things. Before that, he had get better prayer. He, the Assyrians were besieging Jerusalem, right. and he prayed. And even though his prayer went up to God, because God then told Isaiah to tell him that Jerusalem going to be okay, not to fear. Amen. And, and it's a great illustration. Thank you, Gene, for sharing that, that he prayed to God, but God talked to Isaiah, who then talked to Hezekiah and gave him the answer. I, I, I just want to affirm that we see over and over again the instance that our prayers change things. Outcomes change. Situations change. Now, we might argue, well, God knew that the person was going to pray, and so God already planned that this was going to happen, and that probably and could be and does happen. God lives outside of time. He knows the beginning and the end all at the same time, and that certainly is true. But speaking from our experience, speaking from our perspective, the Bible affirms our prayer changes things. By us praying, we have things that we wouldn't have if we did not ask. We have the power to change things. And certainly, that seems to be what is taught by Jesus himself and through the whole Old Testament. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. He affirms that our prayers change things. So, if our prayers can change the situation, this does not degrade God's sovereignty because we don't force God to do anything. And God's will is always done. So, we need to understand that God is not disrespected or shown less honor, but the fact that we seek His will and that's really the key in this. Uh, we want to pray always for God's will. God sovereignly can choose to answer our prayers. And I affirm very strongly, prayer works. Prayer matters. Ch situations change. Now, if we believe that about prayer, why can't we believe that evangelism works? That the gospel changes things? That the situation can change in people's lives. This is not speaking against God's sovereignty. It is speaking about our interaction with his sovereignty so that we would be part of God's plan. The Bible says very clear that we have a place in that. Romans 10, 14-15 How shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? And Paul's, Paul's point here is our going, speaking the gospel, allowing them to hear, allows them to believe. And so we are used to, to communicate God's truth. So, while God is sovereign, all people can believe, and that's why we can go and preach to all people. We can go, we don't have, oh, I look at that person, you know, he has that punky, spiky hair, and he has rivets in his jacket, and I don't think God's chosen him to be saved. He doesn't, he doesn't look like, he doesn't look like God's chosen one there, and, and that, that woman, oh my goodness, you should see, she, she's wearing... Hot pants up to her crotch. I mean, that, that, that woman, oh my goodness. She looks like a hooker. God couldn't have chosen her to be saved. Let's find a nice, decent person who's sitting over in the library. We're going to evangelize the library over there. Let me tell you, you cannot tell from the outside of somebody what God's doing on the inside. And God works amazing things in people's lives. And I have experienced it. I've shared with people on the street. I have, by my own humiliation, recognized God's sovereign in who he brings to himself. But I am called. I am a must. I must 
share the gospel. This is a requirement in order for the gospel to be effective. That's in God's sovereign plan. But I've seen, I've seen with my own eyes, God change the heart of somebody right in front of my eyes. And I know the Holy Spirit works and does that. And you can't guess beforehand who's going to respond and who isn't. Point four. Hell is real, and you have to believe in order to avoid hell. Somehow we have gotten, our culture affects us, and we kind of get into this mode, well, everybody goes to heaven. It doesn't matter what they believe. They can be, you know, into, uh, you know, new, new age stuff, and they're, 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 they're using their incense each evening, and they're, they're, <laughs> they're meditating, and they're thinking positive thoughts. They're a really nice person. They're so nice. You know, they have to go to heaven. It, um, years ago, there was <laughs> a, a cartoon. It's because all dogs go to heaven. And it's kind of, <laughs> kind of that thing. It's like we have this, well, you know, it, God will work it out. God will figure it out. That person was really nice. He was really good. We need to understand what the Bible really says. And it really says the reason people go to hell is they don't believe. And this is in, in you know, everybody knows John 3.16, right? We've all memorized it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Wonderful. Great, great. But how many people have memorized John 18? Just a couple verses later. I tell you, we haven't. And this, what it says in John 3.18 he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reason people go to hell is because they didn't believe. It's not that God didn't choose them, it's that they didn't believe. This is an important point. We do not see nor know God's sovereign plan and can see and look on somebody else to see if whether they're a chosen one or not. God does choose. Not disputing that. But it never says, so-and-so went because he wasn't elect. God didn't, it says people go to hell because they didn't believe. And this judgment is on them because they didn't believe. This is important because it's the act of belief that changes everything. John 5, 24. Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Jesus talked about the experience of being born again. It is, you were dead, now you're alive. It is a turning point in a person's life. It is not a process. I've had some people say, well, I've been talking to that person for 20 years, and they're slowly getting to be a believer. <laughs> and I think, well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad they're, but they're either a believer or they're not. It's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. It's not like an in-betweenness. You're either saved or you're not saved. This is how the Bible speaks about our salvation. It's a born again. It's a situation there. And we are really rescuing people out of damnation. They are under judgment of God, and we're rescuing them. So it can be said that we are winning our brother. I remember I was in a church service. And a very meaning, uh, well-meaning young man in his 20s stood up and said, you keep on talking about winning people for Christ. And, and I find that uncomfortable to talk about that way. Uh, it sounds like you're, you're winning somebody in a contest. That's, that's so crass. It's so inappropriate, he said. 
And he has a point that does sound like, what do you, you know, you, you had a contest and you won somebody. But I wanted to, to get up, a, it was a large meeting, so I didn't do this personally, but I wanted to get up and take that man aside privately and said, you know, you have a point. I understand where you're coming from, but we use the word winning because that's what the Bible uses as a term for saving somebody. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 20, for I am free from all men. I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, not being under the law myself, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not, though not being without the law of God, uh, but under the law of Christ, so I might win those who were without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all men means save more. Now this is again another familiar passage, but there's a lot of stuff in there that I think that we skip over to much. First, the idea of win means to gain. To, um, to profit, to, uh, it is really the kind of, uh, that we have brought them onto our side, maybe a way of, of staying. But did, did you notice that Paul also talks about saving people? I, I remember having somebody say, saying, you don't save people, God saves people. You shouldn't talk about you saving people. But the Bible says that we do save people. Uh, Paul just used that term. I want to save people. And what's interesting, that's what he said in other places. Uh, Romans eleven fourteen, If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, just as, I always, uh, just as I also please all men in all things, I'm seeking not my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. And uh, Paul said, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, again, uh, this passage about, I, I want to save more people. Now, it's not that Paul believed he died for people's sins. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he is helping to deliver somebody from damnation. He's helping to remove the penalty because the Bible speaks that we are in a snare before coming to the Lord. 2 Timothy 2, 25-26. With gentleness, correcting those in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Paul presents the situation of the non-believer as somebody who is held captive to do Satan's will. And that is what he teaches in Romans, where we, are, we have no ability to do good before we get saved. We are held captive. And so in a sense, we are... Have you ever seen a poor animal in a snare or a trap crying out? An animal who's in pain, an animal who is, can't escape. And you wanted to go over to the trap and, and, and remove the, the, the trap, or remove the, what's snaring them, what's holding their leg, or what's keeping them from moving forward. I know I have, have many times. I want to help the poor defenseless animal. Well, why can't we have that all, same spirit toward other people? That they too are snared into a world system that tells them that this is all you got. And, no, and they know that if this is all we got, it's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There is no hope. There's nothing beyond this world. And they live their life every day caught in this trap. It gives no hope, and it gives no happiness and peace. 
This is something we save them from. We are used by God to save people, to win our brother and sister from Christ, for Christ. It may sound crass, but we are as part of the salvation process as Jesus was on the cross. We save people. Now, that leads to point five, which I, I feel is important, and I have no time to do, elaborate on it, but that is the reason we share the gospel is the gospel changes lives. We have forgotten too often that we are not just giving them the opportunity of eternal life, but a life here today. Because the presence of God in our lives is what gives us hope, peace, and, and true fulfillment today. We can live a life of joy and happiness today that comes through Jesus Christ and we will have eternal life with him. I have done too much work with people and have, have seen with my own eyes people who have had real difficult issues in their lives. Drug addictions, alcohol addictions, sometimes anger issues. And mysteriously, I've seen after they've come to Christ, God take away a lot of those things that held them in bondage. And they got a new peace and had a new perspective on their life through Jesus Christ. This is not just about selling fire insurance. It's not just about saying, well, someday you won't face hell. Preaching the gospel also is offering people a truly meaningful life today so that they can see their purpose for life, see a, 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 have a relationship today with the living God that they might need see hope and peace today and eternal life tomorrow. Again, I've seen too many testimonies, heard too many changes I know God does this, and he does it through the gospel. So let's review. The gospel is so important that it is the way that God uses to change people's lives. The five reasons I st stated is Jesus is the only way to heaven. We are the only way to hear. That's point two. Point three, all who hear and believe will be saved. Point four, people go to hell because they don't believe. And believing changes people's lives today. We need to understand that in God's mystery, we are a cracked pot with a great treasure inside. And next week, I'm going to be talking about how to share. Because it's important that we be equipped and know what to do to share the gospel. And I encourage you to come next week to, to hear more about what God's going to do in that. So, <laughs> let's, let's pray. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, thank you that in your wisdom you would put such a wonderful message in a, a people like us. There's nothing distinctive about us, nothing attractive necessarily on the outside that anybody would know. But God, we know that we have riches that other people really need, that their lives can be transformed and they can find hope today which they don't even realize that they don't have today. Thank you, God, for your greatness and your power, and use us to be your vessels to proclaim to a dark world the light it very much needs. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.